All right, so what I'll do is I'll tell you one more story. Uh, another student sent me a, a video. I actually didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched the first maybe 10 minutes of it, and it seemed pretty good. Uh, it's another uh, social engineering attack uh, demonstration. This is from CBC. Uh, so we'll watch that uh, as well, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on to usability. Okay. Forget if we numbered the examples from last class. Did we peak? Yeah, we did. Okay, uh, so the fourth example of social engineering I'll give you is very similar to the very last one that we talked about at the end of last class. So this was someone who had a Twitter name uh, at Matt. Uh, someone hacked them basically to steal that Twitter name. This is the exact same story. Okay, uh, this person had an even shorter Twitter name. It was just at N, uh, the single letter N. Uh, it was desirable. Uh, he reported that some people had offered him money for it uh, up to 50K, $50,000 US for it. So I don't know what it's actually worth, but that was at least one offer uh, to, to give this thing up. Same kind of story. Someone wanted the Twitter name. Uh, they were going to try and use password reset mechanisms to get it. But this one took a very different turn. So technically, it ended up being uh, sort of different. And so I like the contrast of these two two stories uh, side by side because they sound similar, but this one this one was, was sort of different. Okay, uh, so what happened here is, uh, so there was an adversary. Who wanted at N, okay? So it starts the same way as the at Matt story. Uh, the adversary went to Twitter, uh, said, I'm at N, I forgot my password, I'd like to reset it. Twitter had the exact same response. It said, great, we have your email on file. Uh, because we have your email on file, we'll send a verification link to that email. If you're able to click on that link, then we'll believe that you actually are at N and then we'll let you reset your password, okay? Um, now, in the previous example, it was a Gmail account, okay? So then the adversary went to Gmail and they did the same thing and then it referred them to Apple and then it wanted credit card information. So they went to Amazon and it ended up being this big, long kind of process. OK, what happened here is a little bit different. So what happened here is uh, this person did not have a Gmail account. OK, they actually had their own email account, their own personal email account at their own personal domain that they own. So at first glance, you might think that, that that's probably a better choice, right? Because now you can't go over to Gmail or whatever and try and reset it. Now you're actually kind of taking security into your own hands. And because you take it into your own hands, you're probably more likely to be successful, okay? But it turns out that that, that whole path is just sort of vulner as vulnerable as having someone else manage your email. Um, so I don't know what the exact email is, but we'll just say generically, it was something like user at domain.com. Uh, where this was at N's personal domain. Similar to at Matt, we know all of this because the person ended up having a conversation uh, with the person who, who breached the account and they sort of described the steps that they, that they used. Okay. Um, all right. So let's say you're the adversary. Uh, you want to reset Twitter. Twitter's going to send this email to some domain. You don't control that domain. What now? Okay, so you can't reset it because it's, you know, it's jeremyclark.com or whatever. So it's not like webmail. It's not like I have an interface that lets anyone reset my password. Is there any password you could reset? The, I guess you can take over the registration for the domain. Okay, great. So that domain belongs to me. Okay, so I had to register that domain somewhere and that website has a username password. Okay, so if I go to that website and say, hi, I'm the owner of domain.com, I forgot my password, right? Then I can actually take over that domain. So that's what happened. So in this case, the domain register was GoDaddy. So, well, first off, what they did is they had to figure it out. So they, um, they went to whois, uh, which was the same way that we got the, in the at Matt story, whois got the home address of uh, Matt Honan. Uh, so they said whoisdomain.com and uh, they saw that it was registered uh, by GoDaddy. Uh, 
So then the adversary went over to GoDaddy. So GoDaddy is a very popular domain registrar site. And they basically said, I own domain.com. I forgot my password. Could you reset it for me? OK. Uh, GoDaddy, uh, because this is a e-commerce site, so the person paid money to register this domain, uh, GoDaddy has this person's credit card information on file. Uh, and so they said, great, we're happy to reset it. Uh, what we need is the last six digits of your credit card. OK. Uh, and the adversary didn't have it, okay? This happened to happen after the at Matt story. So after at Matt, Amazon like completely changed all their policies. So that trick that was used in that story uh, no longer was, was sort of a viable trick uh, anymore, okay? So this person had to come up with another way to get the last six digits of a credit card uh, that, that they didn't know, all right? Uh, so what the adversary did is they figured out that this guy at N, N had a PayPal account. So they went over to PayPal and uh, they actually called PayPal. And this is where it also sort of deviates. Instead of pretending to be the customer, uh, what they did is they actually pretended to be another PayPal employee. So they called up PayPal and said, hi, I'm, I'm also with PayPal. I'm in a different division. I really need uh, the last, and in this case, they, uh, for whatever reason, they knew that, they, that what would be on file was the last four digits of this person's credit card, not the last six. So we'll, we'll close that gap in a second. But they said they made up a big story about why they really needed uh, those last four digits of the credit card for some reconciliations of the accounts or something like that. So the pretext they used was a PayPal employee from a different division. The elicitation was for uh, the last four digits of the credit card. And uh, I'm not sure that the, I don't recall the story having a lot of details of, of everything that happened, but at the end of the day, they were able to obtain it. Okay, so they got the last four digits. So they're almost there. They just need the last six digits. Okay, uh, what's, how many, so you're missing two digits. How many possible two digits are there? There's 100, right? Uh, so 00, zero to 99. Um, and uh, some credit cards have like kind of redundancy like built into the number and things like that. So you can immediately identify it as an incorrect credit card without actually checking with the bank and things like that. So I'm not sure how many guesses it would take, but 100 is not that unreasonable. You could call a company, you wouldn't want to get the same person on the phone 100 times, uh, but you could call and say, they'll be like, what's the last six digits? And you'd be like, blah, blah, like guess, guess, and then give the correct last four. And they'd be like, oh, no, that's not right. And then you might be like, oh, yeah, sorry, I read it wrong. And you might get like two or three guesses at it before they hang up, right? But then you could just call back. And if you did that, you could do it maybe 33 times if you get three guesses per time. And that's that's not that unreasonable, right? If you did that over a course of a week or a month and you didn't get the same person on the phone, then you could actually do that. Um, so they were there were within 100 guesses of... of having the last six digits given they had the last four digits. Okay, uh, so anyways, but actually what happened was a little simpler for the adversary. So they called PayPal up and they were able to just convince the person that they actually were the person. And for some reason they didn't have that information at their fingertips, 
Okay. And so the person on the other hand was trying to be helpful and they actually ended up kind of guessing for them. So the person on the other end of the line would try a couple numbers and then eventually they found the right one. Uh, and then both of them were happy uh, and, and they went ahead and reset it. Okay. So uh, they called tech support. Or sorry, so, so this is at GoDaddy, my mistake. Uh, let me just, I just want to make sure I write this in a nice way. Uh, so they called tech support. Uh, so the pretext is going back to hi, I'm at N. I wish I had this person's real name, but I just forgot to look it up. Um, so the pretext is I'm at N and I want to reset uh, the password. Support believed uh, the preset or the pretext. And helped guess the remaining two digits. OK, uh, so the outcome of this is now the adversary owns that domain. OK, so they own the domain. Uh, now what they can do is they can point. Uh, so if an email gets sent, uh, for example, an email from Twitter resetting the password gets sent to user at domain.com. How does that email actually get sent? So Twitter's sending it, okay? So they have to figure out where that email is going. So Twitter goes to DNS and they say, I need the mail server address for domain.com. Okay, so that's in what's called the MX record of your DNS. Uh, so they go, they look that up, and then they send the email to that IP address. Okay, so once the domain registry system updates, uh, then uh, this person can change that record uh, and they can point it at their own mail server. Okay, so then that email from Twitter, it will go to the same address, it will go to the correct address, it just won't get sent to the right IP address. Okay, so it will end up at the adversary's mail server instead of at the uh, proper mail server of this person. Okay, uh, so the adversary owns the domain at this point. And so they set a uh, mail server record to point at a server they control. Okay. And then basically they have to wait. So DNS won't update right away. So GoDaddy will change it, but Twitter's DNS is probably not GoDaddy. Uh, so they're getting their DNS records from somewhere else, okay? So when records change, they sort of get broadcast and then they kind of percolate through the whole DNS infrastructure. And eventually Twitter's own DNS servers will learn about the updated uh, record, okay? So that could take three days or something like that. Uh, so it could take a couple days uh, for the record, okay? Uh, so the record has to update across DNS. This might take on the order of three days. And then once it's that, once that's done, then they can reset the password. Okay. Now, what happened in this story is Aden presumably had read about Atmat, didn't want something similar to happen where all their devices get wiped and like crazy things like that. And uh, I forget exactly why, but uh, for some reason, when uh, the uh, reset happened at GoDaddy, uh, they were notified. Okay, so they got some email or something like that. Uh, so 
at this time it was they were still receiving their own email because the the server hadn't been updated so they got an email about it uh being updated and they were like okay that's fishy and then they started looking into it uh so they called up godaddy and uh they said you know what happened and godaddy's like um we don't believe that you are who you are right because uh the the person who had changed all the password also changed all the account information so now when the real person calls up they don't believe him that he's actually the the original owner and so they're like you're gonna have to go through this process like send i think you have to send some identification in the mail or something like that and it looked like it was going to take weeks to resolve okay so he could have got his domain back from godaddy but at this point they actually didn't believe him that he th they thought he was the attacker uh not the other person uh, and so he could see the writing on the wall. He could see that the DNS record was modified. He knew that within three days he would lose his Twitter account. And so he somehow reached out to the person hacking it and basically said, I'll just give you my Twitter password. Uh, you can take it. And uh, uh, in exchange, I, you know, it'd be great if I kept my domain back. Uh, the other thing is that, that all his email that was sent to that address would end up at the adversary, right? So it's not just like the adversary gets his Twitter account, the adversary gets the whole pipeline of all, all email and he wouldn't be able to receive any email. Uh, so it would have been a big deal. So anyways, they were able to negotiate, uh, if I recall the details of the story, right? A sort of deal where they swapped the Twitter account for, <coughs> for getting the domain, uh, the domain name Mac. Um, so that one had a, a relatively happy ending uh, compared to the at Matt case, although he did lost the lose the Twitter domain, and then I forget for both of them, the person who obtained it didn't actually do anything like really interesting with that Twitter account. Uh, so in both the at Matt case and the at N case, I think they at most like they served up some advertisements or something like that. Uh, in one case, I think they just didn't do anything with it, uh, and so it hardly seemed worthwhile. But um, uh, anyways, this one this one actually had a, a sort of happier ending. Um, so the Okay, uh, if you want to read the full stories, uh, they're on the website. Uh, so there's a link uh, to all of them. And there's a lot of details. And I haven't, I've taught this a few years, but the last time I read it was maybe a year or two ago. So I've uh, even forgot some of the details myself. So hopefully I got most of it right. Uh, but uh, anyways, the articles are interesting. There's, there's lots of little small details that are, um, are, I'm not actually covering. Okay, questions about this? Right. So, so in this case, actually, all the indications, I don't know how it was set up, but I believe that in this case, it, it was actually hosted by, it was a private mail server. Yeah. So the big problem here is that you always forget that another third party that's involved is your domain registrar. Right. So even if you completely control your own mail server, uh, when someone, when I send email to your name at domain.com, right, DNS is going to turn that into an IP address. And that involves third parties it involves third parties that have passwords and uh have password reset policies and so if you can disrupt that process then uh you can yeah you can do a lot yeah so there's uh there's a lot of examples now like hijacking domains uh, is, is a very popular way of, of doing social engineering uh so domain registers got hit hard for a couple of years where there were a lot of attacks that were really based on on hijacking the domain yeah. The other kind of attack that I believe will be in the CBC thing that we'll watch in a second uh, is hijacking SIM card uh, numbers. Uh, so a lot of times, sometimes they'll send a reset through your phone. So you get a text message. 
Uh, also, with any kind of two-factor authentication, uh, then you might get a text message with a, that extra factor of authentication. Uh, and so phone numbers can also similarly be hijacked. If you can call Bell or Rogers up or Videotron or whoever, and you can convince them that you're someone else, uh, then you can add a new SIM card to your account or that type of thing. Then you can actually hijack a lot of, a lot of systems that rely on the phone system as well, similarly. So these domain and your phone number, these are like really kind of low level backbone infrastructure. Uh, and yeah, if you can take them over, you can disrupt a lot of things, right? And so this idea of, of going after the domain, we also saw in SSL. So in SSL, uh, while this adversary was here, once, once they were able to reset GoDaddy and get the domain, they could have also got certificates for that website and, and done all sorts of things as well to attack the actual website. <coughs> Other questions or comments? Okay, uh, so let's have movie time now. Uh, so this is uh, from just a CBC show uh, where they, uh, there's two social engineers and they're just showcasing some of the attacks uh, that you can do. They're a little bit different than the ones that we've seen so far. Um, so I'll make this a movie environment. Maybe we'll go all the way off. Commissioner. 
Since then, there had been over a dozen cases involving social engineering in the telco sector alone. <laughs> and companies around the world admit social engineering attacks are on the rise. We're in New York City, about to meet with some cybersecurity pros who are going to tell us and show us how hacking can hurt us all and what we can do to stop them. And this is what the bad guys do. They actually spend time trying to force errors. This is Info Security North America. Dozens of experts, hundreds of enthusiasts, finding flaws in security systems and showcasing solutions all in one place. From videos that teach you how to avoid getting hacked, the biggest threat to an organization is your users. We call it the human firewall. Instead of a user blindly clicking on links or opening attachments, we want to train that user to take a moment, think about what they're going to do, and then actually make a decision, an informed decision. To interactive games like squashing bad computer bots. So we are differentiating bad bots from humans. Hey. And so, as you play, you'll see bots light up in random locations, and you have to smash the bots. It's pretty hard, right? Top three! There's even a security-themed escape room. Okay, an escape room? What does this have to do with social engineering? So we're, uh, we do immersive security awareness training. So the first codes for the rotors is B124. So in this room, there's a bunch of puzzles that have to do with helping people understand what social engineering is and how they can better protect themselves. These guys are at the conference, too. They're ethical hackers, ready to use their skills on my cable provider, Rogers. It's just psychology. So if you understand how somebody's going to react to something, you can easily uh, manipulate somebody into giving them information or access to things that maybe they should. Okay. Let's All give right, it a go, so, guys. So I'm going to call this number. It will look as if I'm calling from you. And uh, I am Matthew, your personal assistant. Will the ref fall for it? Hi, this is a... Well, well, my name is Matthew. I'm actually uh, I'm calling on behalf of my boss. Uh, I'm her personal assistant. Uh, her name, though, is Trossy Agro. So basically, she's asked me to call and uh, and get HBO added and, and also just verify a, a couple things about her account. Yes, I should have been. is not buying it. If at first you don't <coughs> succeed, just hack, hack again. Think of how many people work there, though. You only need one out of a group. So Joshua tests a new Rogers rep. Hello, <coughs> The same old trick with a twist. This time, he's impersonating me. And my name is Charlesy. Agro. How are you doing? I'm doing well. to add HBO to my account? It's a four digit thing for security. Can I have it, please? Uh, yeah, it's one, two, three, four. Uh, it's not about it. No, it's normally the one I use. Let's, let's try, uh, 0246. That's the other one. Wrong pin, but the ref doesn't flag it. Strike one. on my 
my account. A serious strike number three. And the game's not over yet. He even adds his own security question. We'll go with the name of the first pet. Customers' privacy? I think they are. 
Meet Robert Gibbs. He's the head of the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association, an industry group representing some of the big telcos. I think they're, that they are putting mechanisms in place, that they are uh, training and educating, but the difficulty is staying ahead of the fraudsters. I know they're good. You know how I know they're good? We had two ethical hackers. They teamed up. Um, they got into my Rogers account. They had the wrong PIN number. They had my wrong postal code, and they still got in. So that's troubling for me as the consumer, but I want to know how troubling that is for you. Yeah, well, obviously, protecting the security of my members' customers is something that's vitally important to them. And that's why they will continue to educate, they will continue to train, uh, but there's always going to be human error, there's always going to be fraudsters out there, uh, and it's up to uh, all industries to ensure that they do the best to protect individual security with a constantly evolving technology that's only going to grow into the future. Experts have been really clear with us that companies need to move away from the personal information as a way to authenticate or validate the user. When are you going to step up and tell companies, let's make a change, <coughs> this isn't working? Yeah, uh, well, that's only one portion of what they do. So whether or not it's asking what your birth date is or what your address is, that's why they're adding in now pins, passwords, security questions, so even though they have these measures in place, it doesn't seem to matter. They're not working. They got in anyway. Well, they are working. The thing is, there's millions of yeah, for me. There's millions of dollars that come in every week. And there's always going to be uh, some human error that's going to exist. And But you're right. It's got to be about educating those frontline services. Yeah. It's got to be about training those frontline services. And that needs to continue and needs to be more vigilant uh, into the future. Ethical hackers Joshua and Alex agree. Companies shouldn't be asking for personal information to verify us. But they also say we shouldn't make it too easy for hackers by sharing too much ourselves. So many people will use their, their children's names or birth dates or their, their animals' names as passwords. And then you go onto their social media and they've posted a million pictures of the same dog with the name of the dog and they're basically putting their passwords out there for everyone to see. Is he right? Do we really share too much? We're taking that question to the street. What kind of passwords do you have? Like a dog's name, a birthday? I do use my dog's name. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? That was cheaper. I miss living in Toronto. Okay, uh, so that was a fun uh, video. So one final thing we'll do is we'll just sort of wrap up uh, this. Okay, what can you do about it? So we saw lots of attacks. We developed the theory of the attacks. Uh, you saw lots of examples of it in action. Hopefully you're convinced now that this is actually a pretty serious threat vector. Uh, it's an attack vector that people are using. You see it against real companies, uh, high security companies, companies that care about security. Uh, so what do we do? How do we respond to it? Okay, so maybe you could reduce uh, it to like a robot world where everything's fully automated, but that's probably not going to happen, right? So most, unfortunately, most corporations, well, fortunately 
for us because we like jobs. Uh, most corporations uh, hire humans, right? And humans do a lot of the work uh, inside of companies. Uh, but education is good. Uh, so it, it's basically, you can think of it as two ways. So in a lot of cases, you're really dependent on the firms that you use, right? Like you can't do anything about Rogers if you use Rogers and they have bad you know, policies for resetting SIM cards, right? That's not your problem to fix. Now, some of you will go and work for Bell or you'll work for Rogers, uh, right? Uh, so if you're a firm, uh, there's, there's a set of, of tools that you can use. And then we'll think about, well, what about us outside of a firm? So if you're in the context of a company, you're working for the company itself. Uh, first off, you need to understand the threat. Uh, so that falls under education. Uh, the second thing that you can do is you can review your policies, uh, especially for things like uh, that require, you know, there should be a policy about everything. Every action that you take on behalf of a client or access to different rooms in your facilities, whatever it is, there's some policy somewhere. Uh, and so you need to review it. Uh, maybe have a professional review it. Make sure there aren't loopholes. Make sure there aren't escalation of privilege issues uh, in it. Uh, and you want to train uh, the people who will serve as access points. And that's basically everyone in your company, right? Everyone in your company probably has an email address and they're probably running that email from a computer that's on your network. So technically they're a point of access to your network. Right? You don't open your corporate network up to the outside world, generally speaking. Uh, and so as a result, you want to keep people off that are external to your corporate network, off your corporate network. Everyone who's on that network is a technically an access point. Right? Uh, and so in that sense, you, you do have to train people. Now, in this case, the trainings may be lighter weight. It's only about emails and don't open attachments and those kinds of things. Uh, it's not. And then you would have more specialized training depending on what uh, people's roles were in the company, okay? Uh, but you have to review all the policies and, and make sure that, that you figure all of that out. We're going to circle back to policies and procedures later, okay? So that's something that we'll think of also from a security perspective, kind of related to social engineering, but we're going to think more generically about when you write down a policy, does it actually do what you think it does? Are there loopholes in the policy? Uh, policies, it sounds like a human thing, they're not always human things, right? Even if it's a fully automated policy that machines are, are uh, deciding there still is some policy in effect and there are ways to sidestep the policy or the policy sometimes has uh, unintended consequences. So we'll spend most of the time on actually uh, a policy that you may have looked at in other courses, but we'll look at it from an actual policy standpoint, which is something browsers use uh, to isolate websites uh, called the same origin policy. Uh, so this is a fully automated policy, but Anyways, uh, we'll come back to policies itself. Okay, now let's say you don't work, you don't work at a bank, you don't work at a cell phone company. Uh, what can you do uh, about social engineering? So you can't do anything directly about it. Of course, you can make sure that, that your accounts are as secure as possible and things like that, but um, you can't really control what information someone gives out about your accounts or what access they give. Uh, the one thing that you can do, though, is uh, when you model a system, so for example, let's say that you're doing some web system, you're trying to decide, uh, how should I authenticate my users? Should I use passwords? Should I use two-factor authentication, right? You have to keep uh, social engineering in mind, okay? That should be part of the landscape of what you're designing. So if you're going to send you know, authenticating information through a phone, you need to know that social engineering is an effective attack at hijacking someone's phone. And you have to understand what the consequences are. And even though that's technically not your problem, by you relying on that, that it becomes your problem, 
right? So in the original video, they didn't really go into the detail, but uh, the person who was uh, originally interviewed, uh, she had worked at this like Bitcoin company and things like that. And there were a lot of people who lost their Bitcoin because of cell phone attacks. So there were a lot of exchange services that were set up where the phone was in the loop uh, for authenticating information. And once you got someone's SIM card, then you could ju just drain their funds. OK, and that was it, it is the fault of the cell phone companies, right? They shouldn't uh, have loopholes in their policies that allow someone to hijack your SIM card. It's also the fault of the exchanges for relying on that as if it were reliable when in reality it isn't. OK. Um, So for ex just some examples, you can consider the reliance on uh, things like DNS. We saw attack on DNS, uh, you know, phone numbers, SMS, email. Okay. Now, at, at the end of the day, you have to assume some things are secure, right? And so, uh, but still, you could look at uh, sort of recent threats and, and try and sort of establish which ones are, are maybe more likely to be uh, secure and, and less likely to be secure. Uh, In-person actions as well. So like if you're getting a certificate, uh, we saw a certificate issuance based on DNS. Uh, we saw a certificate issuance based on email. So any of those social engineering uh, attacks could have resulted in, in fraudulent certificates as well. Uh, with EV certificates, you see in-person validation. We saw an actual social engineering attack there as well. Um, and so these are, these are sort, of, sort of important considerations. Okay, uh, so that's all I want to say about social engineering. Any questions or comments before we move on to the next topic? Why doesn't government have like strict laws against social engineering? So they do. So uh, a lot of those things could have been illegal, right? Uh, impersonating other people is fraud. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not an expert in exactly what you would get charged with. But, but doesn't just punish that crime if you do social engineering? Yeah. A lot of it is also um, because it's sort of small scale fraud. Uh, I uh, took $30,000 from you by showing a gun, then I would have been punished very bad. But right. that guy or that hacker used social engineering, he was not punished. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so uh, I know that for a fact that the law would distinguish those two because under the law, they actually believe that if you're held up by a gun, it is worse because there is a threat on your life. The gun could go off by accident. It shows a violence on behalf of the criminal. And so that, that should, in my opinion, actually be considered a worse offense. But you are right that these white collar crimes, as they're called, are sort of hacking based crimes. Um, uh, they tend not to be uh, pursued as much. Uh, I don't know. I can't speak for law enforcement, but I think there's a couple things that come into play. Uh, one is the prevalence of them. So a lot of them are kind of like small amounts and law enforcement just doesn't have time to trace them that trace them all around. Um, there's the problem that when they're perpetrated digitally, you have no idea where the criminal is, right? Someone holds you up at gunpoint their security cameras, they were in a location at that time, you can sort of backtrack, uh, you have a kind of physical location. Uh, these could be conducted by people in countries that aren't even under the jurisdiction of, of say the RCMP in Canada, right? So they will investigate any crime against you because it occurred in Canada, the crime occurred in Canada, so it's under their jurisdiction, but they can't, even if they find the person and they're in Russia, which I'm not, nothing against Russia, but like a lot of uh, attacks come uh, say from Russia, 
uh, if, if that were the case, then they would have to cooperate with law enforcement in Russia, even if they knew exactly who did it, right? So you get these sort of cross-jurisdictional issues. And then the other thing with digital uh, attacks is it's often easy to obfuscate the trail as well. So you just don't know who did it because it came from some phone number that was routed through five different accounts in, in five different countries and you can't backtrace it, right? Or uh, later we'll look at something called Tor, uh, for browsing the internet anonymously. So you funnel your kind of internet traffic through a bunch of servers and, and you can't figure out the original IP addresses as well. Yeah, so it's sort of a combination of all these things. Now, every now and then hackers do get caught. And I think because it's so rare that they get caught that uh, law enforcement sometimes wants to make examples of them. So then they'll really put the hammer down hard uh, so in that case, like someone might actually get more time for stealing $30,000 digitally than holding someone up at gunpoint because law enforcement wants to create a deterrence against it. They know they can't catch everyone. They're catching way less as a percentage. So the ones they do catch, they try to uh, give heavy sentences to. And so there's actually a lot of criticism of also uh, how heavy the sentences are for, for hackers in particular. Uh, so there's a lot of criticism where people feel that law enforcement went way overboard and gave like super long sentences that, that are, are sort of not proportional to the crime. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, I'm not here to persuade you of any political opinions. I'm just trying to lay out kind of what, where the discussion is. You can read lots online. There's people on every side of that debate that believe different things, but it's an interesting, interesting discussion to think about. Yeah. Like right, right, right. So that that would be very sensible. So websites have started to do that now. Like if you if there's a new login to Gmail or to Twitter or something like that, they'll kind of notify you. So they're trying to bring you into the loop. It's a great idea for companies. I don't know why they haven't done it. Probably just because rolling out that technology would be too uh, kind of difficult, right? Uh, there's also the question of what you could really do, right? Like so, right now you get a text message from you know Rogers, whoever you're with. And uh, they say, OK, someone's trying to access your account. What, what are you going to actually do, right? Um, I guess you could call them up and change all of your things. But yeah, yeah. but it, it is sensible. It's a sensible solution. It just hasn't been rolled out. Maybe in five years, that's sort of where we'll be at. Yeah, or there'll be at least more of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So that sort of works. Lockout policies are a little tricky. Uh, so first off, I can use it as a as an attack itself, as a denial of service. So I don't want you to use your card, so I'm going to uh, lock you out of your account. And then uh, the assumption is that you, the real person, are going to phone in and like to unlock your account. But you as a real person trying to unlock your account and the adversary trying to unlock your account pretending to be you end up being equivalent. Like the company still doesn't know which is which. So they give you an opportunity to unlock it. They're actually kind of just giving more opportunities to the adversary to guess things. So uh, I'm not saying that lockouts are not sensible, but you have to think through like the full consequences of lockouts. Yeah. So we see lockouts with, uh, for example, your bank card. Uh, so we'll talk about that in procedures as well. That's another protocol. Uh, and so it will lock it out after a cer certain number of pin guesses. But in that case, I do have to get physical access to your card uh, in order to even engage in that particular lockout policy. Yeah, and it's actually really interesting how that lockout policy works. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, but yeah. I think this is where we need regulatory framework where we push all the companies to follow certain standards. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an investment for them. That's why they avoid it. Yeah, yeah, so companies have incentives. Well, they, they sort of highlight in the show, like first off, they actually want to help you, right? Like yeah. you see the bad, examples here, right? But 99% of the people are people who forgot their password legitimately. And uh, they want to help their customers out. They're paying customers and things like that. And so companies don't have sort of the right incentives towards security necessarily uh, until enough of these incidents start happening and it starts affecting them. Um, what you saw as, as a policy sort of response from the Canadian government is more disclosure. So when these attacks happen, then you have to disclose it either to the customers that were affected or at least to the, say, the privacy commissioner uh, that it happened. So I think that's sensible. Uh, 
governments could go in and say, okay, you have to, these are the information that you need to have to reset any password. Like you could pass some regulation that, that would say that, but you know, government doesn't always get things right. And sometimes they can do more harm than good. Like they have good intentions, but if they don't get that regulation exactly correct, uh, then uh, it would cost a lot for the industry. It might not actually secure the pro problem. Uh, if you want to look at uh, government trying to do security without actually being really effective, look at airports. Uh, that's like a bunch of security policies that were designed by government, basically, by CTSA or TSA in the US. Uh, and we'll talk about airport security when we talk about procedures as well. And the short end is that it's not really that effective. It's more about making you feel safe than, than really being effective. Some of the stuff, some of the stuff is okay, some of it's not, it's a mixed bag. Other questions or comments? Personally, I also feel customer service, there should be a privileges for customer services. And uh, the, the, the privilege should not allow them to do some things. And if I thought they are going to do some updates, there should be another check, another uh, second check yep. for approval. And also, I also feel like uh, there could be a kind of uh, redirect for the actual customer to complete that particular process. So for example, maybe a link could be sent to the customer to right. do that, or probably maybe there could be a uh, text message or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually really like that point so much that I'll, I'll add it to the notes. Um, so when you reveal the policy, you try and eliminate escalation of privilege, train people, and you can also reduce the power or maybe a better way is to say to decentralize the power. So um, you have more people involved, more uh, sort of systems that are involved. So decentralize uh, the power over access. So that's a fancy way of saying that maybe the customer rep that answers the phone has too much power. They shouldn't be able to add a SIM to your account. They can help you with basic things, right? They can tell you what your bill amount is or something like that. But if you want to do serious things, then you have to show up in person or yeah, you have to, you have to do something, uh, a different procedure. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. And then you can also have a procedure that, that isn't effective right away. Right. So you do something and then there's some sort of validation period and the person has to respond or things like that. Yeah. So these are, are good ideas. You should probably write a project on it. Well, I think this is goes back to the same thing. It's more like custom centric because it was like that before people have to visit branches and office to then customer only requested we should do it online, which will make the life easier. Yeah, exactly. So back to the circle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, if you go back to evaluation frameworks, you have sort of deployability and you have usability and security, right? And so in this case, it's sort of like security went down to increase usability and also deployability because it's a lot cheaper to do some like web chat system than even having people answer phones, let alone having branches in every small town and, and having people be able to show up. Why did they not implement, for example, a physical device for authentication when it, it's used for email or other stuff, but it's not used for critical um, accounts? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of them use it internally with their employees. I think they just view it as too expensive. So they don't want to give a device to all their customers. It doesn't even solve all the problems you necessarily have. Like customers can lose them. Yeah. Someone can steal that device. Uh, from you and so you would have to manage the whole thing of I can't find my like dongle or whatever uh, So you would have a whole slew of new like Calls from people who can find it and then if you have a policy in place where uh, The person can't find their thing and you're able to send them a new one Then you also just sort of sidestepped all the benefits of giving it as well, right? So now the social engineers will call up and say I forgot my dongle Can you send me a new one to my address? Right, and then they'll get the new one and then they'll they'll just discard it yeah, 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 exactly that kind of thing. So, yeah, you. It, anyways, it, there could be something there, but you'd have to think through the whole thing. But the cost, I think, was was the main, mm -hmm. the main deterrent to that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think implementing voice authentication thing that just like most of you can discuss some simple things that you think about them, they authenticate for you to one? Yeah, so that that's possible as well. Um, there are issues with it, like if you've never called your credit card company.
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are different authentications that you can use. Um, all of them rely on you having the authentic voice in the first place, right? And so most of those systems would probably, I don't know the details of them, but they, they might operate on what's sometimes called the trust on first use principle, TOFO, uh, which basically says the first time the person calls, we believe it's really them. And then every subsequent call has to match that first call, right? But the first call is the adversary, then, then it's not an effective approach, but it's better than nothing. Um, and then additionally, you still have false positives, right? So people's voice change, they have colds, you know, listen to my voice from last week on the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you have that as a backup mechanism, then uh, the social engineer will always exploit the backup mechanism. Like that's really, a lot of these attacks are sort of uh, going after the backup mechanism, right? Because they always know that, companies always know that people forget things or they can't always have all the information and things like that. Uh, and so that's basically what the, the social engineers do, right? So if there's any chance that legitimately voice authentication wouldn't work, say it, even if it was 1% or 0.1% of the time, for that 0.1% of the time, they do have to have some contingency, right? And the social engineer will just show up, trigger that contingency, and then work within that con contingency conditions, yeah? So that's another general security principle, which is uh, your security system is only as secure as the weakest link. Right? So if there's 10 different ways to attack a system, the adversary is going to choose the weakest, right? And they'll, they'll engineer the right condition so that that's the condition that you're looking at as well. But yeah, good comment. Uh, other comments or questions on this? Okay. What if there's a one minute video session? If there's a one minute video session? Yeah, like, like uh, for example, uh, in order to authenticate the customer, right customer, yeah. like they can, you know, Yeah, so there could be something like that. So and it is costless as well. Well, it sort of depends. So it relies on the person having video technology, right? So they'll just call and they'll be like, you know, I'm 80, I don't have a cell phone. Uh, I'm calling from my rotary phone, right? That's what the social engineer will say. Yeah, yeah, but it's more yeah. Than getting the camera itself. So you have to have a device with a camera. Uh, so some. This is used sometimes, like sometimes if you write exams or something like that online, they'll actually, they'll make you turn your webcam on so they can watch you sort of write it. Um, anyways, it, it's not 100% foolproof. My mind's, you could do an attack tree on how you would break it. Like you could have a video of someone, right? Uh, now AI is, is pretty good machine learning at that kind of task. Uh, so you can do these face swaps where, yeah, I take your face and put it on me, but my mouth is moving, so it's driving the image of your face or whatever. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. But, but anyways, that, that's not to say that it, it doesn't do nothing. But yeah, you, have to, you always have to weigh the pros and the cons and the costs and uh, how effective it is. And then once again, you have to go back to your, what's the backup policy, right? Someone doesn't have a camera, are you going to say, sorry, you can't do business with us? Right? Or are you going to say, well, for you, we'll just use your postal code and, and last name. As soon as you say that, you make that provision to one customer, that's where the social engineer will go. Other questions? Comments? Okay, uh, take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about usability. Okay, uh, so the next topic we'll talk about is usability uh, as it relates to security. So this is sort of thematically the same because we're still talking about humans. Uh, in this case, we're not talking about attacking via humans. We're talking about more on the defensive side, the humans that are going to use security systems. Okay, uh, usability we touched on when we talked about evaluation framework. So you already saw a few usability considerations so you sort of have a sense of uh, what it's about but now we're going to go into a lot more detail about how would you establish whether if I come to you with a security tool and I say it's very usable how can you decide uh, yeah that actually is usable or no that's that's not usable right and it's not good enough that just my opinion is that it's usable okay uh, so we should have some methodology right uh, for trying to establish how usable something is 
Uh, so I'll present you with uh, a couple different methodologies. We'll look at sort of three major classes of methodologies. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time. It'll be like one or two lectures on this. Uh, and we'll spend the most time on one methodology, not necessarily because it's the best, but it's the easiest to sort of teach. Uh, and you get to do it in your assignment as well. And, and so you'll get some hands-on experience with it. Um, so before we do that, let me just sort of provide the motivation. So why do we even care about usability? Right. Uh, so everybody, of course, likes, you know, beautiful user interfaces and you like systems that look nice and pretty and are easy to use and all of those types of things. OK, so no one sort of objects to usability. But is it really like a, a sort of hard science where if you're a security person, you have to really care about it? Or is it really just about sort of putting a little polish on your product at the end? OK, so what security usability community will argue is that it's actually a very important component. OK, it's not just a little polish uh, that you put on at the end of, of your protocol. If you mess up the usability, uh, then you could actually in turn end up messing up the security of uh, your entire approach. OK, um, so why is that? So let's consider that you develop some sort of system or solution. And it's very secure. No one's disputing uh, that it isn't secure, but it lacks that kind of polish. So it's uh, secure, but not usable. Okay. Here's all. Here's just a small set of things that could go wrong. Okay. So the first thing is users might not use it, right? They might just turn it off, right? And so a lot of times these security me mechanisms are opt-in, right? No one tells you that you have to install all these security extensions in your browsers and have an antivirus. And, you know, people will give you that as an opinion, but no one's forcing you uh, to do that, right? And so you, at the end of the day, you're choosing what security, say, software that you're running on your phone or on your computer, and it might be none, right? Uh, and so if, you, if I have a really secure product, but no one uses it, then it might as well not exist. OK, um, OK, users might use it, but if they don't understand what the software is doing, uh, in particular, users have what we call a mental model. So they have some model of what this security software is doing. Uh, how is it, what problem is it solving for me? How's it sort of accomplishing it? They might not know all the technical details, but they have some sort of abstract mental model, right? So like a mental model would be like my car. Like, I don't know how my car works, right? But I know if I turn the steering wheel, then the wheels turn, okay? So that's a mental model of, of how a car works. Is it correct? Well, first off, is it sufficient? No, I mean, I can't engineer a car knowing that if you turn the wheels, the you know, the steering wheel, the wheels turn, right? That's not sufficient for me to go out and, and actually engineer a car. Uh, so I don't have all the full details, okay? It's not even necessarily right, right? There are, you know, any kind of modern automobile, when you turn the steering wheel, it doesn't actually turn the wheels. Uh, when you turn the steering wheel, it sends a signal to a computer and the computer says, oh, the person's turning the steering wheel this way. I think I better go and turn the wheels you know, in the same direction. But the computer could decide that uh, if you turn the steering wheel this way, it actually wants to turn the wheels this way, okay? Like there's nothing stopping that. And in fact, it does it sometimes. If there's some sort of situation where you lose traction, uh, then the computer might make a decision about your traction control where it decides it actually needs to turn the wheels the other way to regain traction and then turn it back in the direction that you wanna go. So it takes your input as I wanna go in that direction, not as I want to necessarily turn the wheels in that direction, okay? We're, we'll do whatever it takes to get you going in that direction, okay? So that's a mental model. Uh, the mental model has sort of shortcomings and failings, but in this time it, it sort of helps the user, right? And I don't have to worry about the mechanics of a car and things like that, okay? So mental models aren't good, they're not bad, they're just abstractions. But what is bad is when your mental model leads you astray. Okay, so sometimes you have the wrong mental model of how something works. And because you think you know how it works, but it works differently, then you end up making mistakes when you use the software. And they could be security mistakes as well. Okay, uh, so users could uh, misuse the software.
or the system. I, I'm trying to restrain myself from just calling it software because it applies to any system. It doesn't have to be software. Uh, misuse the system and commit dangerous errors. Or just errors in general, but dangerous errors are, are sort of errors that you can't recover from. We'll define that term later. Okay, uh, another thing is that most users don't go out with security as their primary goal. They're not like, I need to surf the web. My first goal is to make sure I securely surf the web. And then my second goal is to go on Amazon and buy something else, right? It's usually flipped, right? Users want to do something. They want to go on Amazon and they want to buy something. And security is a secondary consideration, okay? It's not their primary consideration. So obviously they want to do it in as, as secure of a way as possible, but their first and primary goal is to obtain that, right? If security is going to step in the way and stop them from achieving their primary goal, then they might just bypass uh, the security mechanism at all. Uh, at all, okay? So you never fully capture the user's attention and get them thinking fully about security. Security is always this sort of secondary consideration uh, where if they can do it in a secure way and it's as easy as doing it in an insecure way, then yes, of course, they'll choose the secure way, right? Uh, but if the secure way is harder, then you can't rely on the fact that they're necessarily going to choose the secure way. Uh, the final thing is that your users and how they respond to your security system, uh, it changes over time, okay? So a user and how they behave and how they use your system on day one is not going to necessarily be the same way that they use your system on day 30, okay? Uh, in particular, think about warnings, right? So the first time you see a warning, you know, you've never seen it before, you're scared, you're reading it, maybe you Google a bit to figure out what it's about, right? The hundredth time you see a warning, you're clicking next, 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 right? Trying to get rid of it, okay? Uh, so users can fatigue usually over time. So uh, the, the ideal, most users are, are almost like sort of the best behaved from a security perspective early, okay? And then later they become, you know, less attuned uh, to, to the security considerations and more attuned to their primary goal of actually accomplishing their task, okay? So just because a user uses it correctly on day one, day two, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, a year from now, they're gonna uh, still be using it the same way, okay? They might eventually get tired of it. So they habituate to warnings. or uh, sometimes it's called fatigue, like warning fatigue, error fatigue. Now this habituation can be good too, right? So also your users sort of become more experts uh, the longer they use their system. They get more comfortable with the system. Maybe something's kind of complicated at first, but once they learn it, uh, then uh, they get better as well, okay? So the fact that, that users sort of dynamically change, they learn from e experience, it can go both positive or negative. So I'm not saying it's only solely negative, but you do have to pay attention to the ways in which it can go negative over time. Uh, a few other sort of miscellaneous points before we, we jump into the methodologies. So here's a few things that, that we sort of know uh, from the usability literature. Uh, the first one is that defaults matter a lot. Okay, so whatever the default action is, most users won't change the default. Okay, there's always users that will go in and change defaults, but most won't. Okay. 
Okay, so you want to pay a lot of attention to how do you configure the default? What's the default setting, right? You'll give the user some control. They can turn on sort of, they can turn the security dial up or down, right? But you're going to pick some initial level and where you pick that level, what, where you sort of set that needle, that can have a lot of influence over A, the security of your users, but also how many users stick with uh, using your security uh, system or tool as opposed to moving on for, for not using it or trying to bypass it. Okay, uh, so defaults are, are really important. Uh, we know this from like even this literature on say sociology. Uh, one example I've seen is there was a study of uh, how many people opted into donating organs if they were to die in a car crash. So let's say you died in an automobile accident, you still have a lot of organs, you could donate them. Uh, the study looked at different states in the United States. Some of them by default, all every state you can choose at the end of the day. Okay. The only difference between the states where some of them you uh, opted in to, or sorry, by default you donated and then you would have to explicitly opt out. Uh, and in other ones you were automatically opted out and you would have to actually say, oh, I actually want to donate. Okay. And the rates were like really like night and day. Like I forget exactly what the numbers are. I'll make them up and say it was something like, you know, 80, 90% when it was on by default and like 20% when it wasn't uh, on um, by default. OK, uh, so those defaults matter. Basically, people didn't really change it. There's always people that have strong opinions and they're, they're going to do whatever they feel. But there's a bunch of people in the middle that just didn't really care. And, and whatever the default was, that's that's sort of what they went with. Um, OK, uh, so defaults matter. Uh, a nice sort of security principle is as much as possible. Uh, you should try and move security decisions away from the human. Uh, so the more things you can do sort of automatically in the background without having to loop the user in, the less fatigue uh, the users will have, the less they have to worry about their mental model uh, of the software. The software sort of just sort of does the right thing. Um, so security works best uh, when decisions are automated and in the background. Okay, uh, the next thing is that the way people use software has changed over time. Uh, so it used to be that, I mean, all of us probably use Microsoft Word or some sort of word processor, right? Think back to like, how did you learn how to use Microsoft Word in the first place, right? Or even let's say you use Google Docs, right? So Google Docs is kind of new. There, you can probably remember the time before Google Docs existed, right? How is it that you learn to use Google Docs, right? Uh, did you sit down and read a manual? Right. And so it used to be that like when you got Microsoft Word, it came with a manual, like a 500 page manual. And that's what people would do. They feel like, oh, I have to read this manual and then I'll know how to use it. And, you know, people were sort of terrified of like messing their computer up. And so they uh, wouldn't read it or they would consult the manual anytime they had problems and things like that. OK, uh, what software developers learned over time is that it's a better user experience if the software itself can sort of guide you. Right. So now software is designed that you just sort of open it up. Right. Like imagine some game that you installed on your, your phone. Like, did you read the manual? Did you read the FAQ? Did you, you know, watch a YouTube video on how to play the game? No, you just sort of you open the app and you press a couple buttons. Maybe you weren't sure everything that was was on that like initial screen, but you somehow found your way around. You sort of stumbled your way around. And then within a week or two, you're not even thinking about what you're doing uh, in terms of using it. OK, so software now is designed so that users learn by doing effectively. OK, and so the way that we think about usability also has shifted to in response to that. So now we have higher expectation of software that we believe that software should guide you uh, to the correct. It should help you use it. OK, we don't we don't like it when software is like, yeah, you can use it, but go read this like 200 pages first and then come back and then use the software. OK, so security software should not be like that either. Right. Uh, security software should guide you through the process and guide you to making sensible decisions. Uh, the next point is that the software is developed by someone. OK, so you have a bunch of developers. 
And guess what? The developers always think the software is usable, right? Because they understand it. They have the, exactly the right mental model because they actually wrote the software. They never make mistakes. They never misuse the software, okay? But we also know from psychology that it's very easy to assume that because something makes sense in your head, you think other, it makes sense to other people, right? And then when you try and write an essay or an assignment or something like that, you learn that uh, when you, you know, something that makes sense in your own head doesn't necessarily make sense to somebody else, right? Uh, and so you have to sort of get out of your head. So developers, the people who make the software are usually the, the worst people to ask about usability, okay? Because they always think it's secure, or sorry, it's usable and there's no problems or issues with it, okay? So more, more than developers, what you really want to do is try and get people that are like kind of as far removed uh, from the system itself to tell you whether it's actually usable, uh, as far removed from the development process as possible. So developers are not the same as your users. Uh, so you shouldn't rely on them necessarily for uh, usability result or uh, usability guidance. Okay. Um, the other thing, let me actually, I'll squeeze it into the, this point because it's related. So software should guide the user. Uh, one thing it does that sort of goes along with guiding the user is it usually provides feedback to the user. Okay, so the user kind of knows the status of what's going on because the user interface is giving them uh, some sort of indication, right? So for example, if a security system is turned on, there might be like a green light and then it's turned off, it's like a red light or something like that. Like there's usually some sort of visual cue or, or the lock, right? In SSL, when you see the lock, you know it's secure. Then now all of a sudden the lock is gone. Now you think it's not secure, right? So it's that sort of persistent uh, cue that's given to the user to indicate what the status of the system is, okay? So that feedback to the user is an important mechanism for guiding the user uh, in using the software itself. Okay, now we wanna do some analysis. So you hand me your latest software, tool, hardware, whatever it is, and you say it's usable. Uh, I wanna say something about whether it's actually usable or not. Okay, uh, so what methodology would I use, right? I could just play around with it and say, yeah, it looks good or it doesn't look good. Uh, sometimes you actually do that in earlier stages of development, uh, but at some point you wanna try and bring some formalism, uh, try and bring some science to actually answering the question of, of whether something is usable or not. Okay, um, so in general, what you're going to do is you're going to do one of three things. So uh, these aren't they're not in any order other than the order that I'll talk about them. So if you want to think of these sort of in order of, of how you would do it, expert review is probably the first thing you do. So you do that early in the development. Uh, it's very cheap. You can do it a lot of times. Then you might do a user study. Then you might do a field study. Okay, but I'm going to present them in this order just because it's a little easier uh, in terms of presentation. Okay, so who's involved in these stages? So let's start with the bottom one. In the expert review, it's actually you get the developers themselves or someone in say it's a company that's producing it, maybe someone who's specialized in security usability, and they're just going to review it themselves. <coughs> so what they're going to do is they're going to try and put themselves in the shoes of somebody that's using the system. <coughs> they're not an actual user per se, and they're going to try and experience what, it, what the experience would be like uh, for an actual user. Okay, they're going to try and simulate it for themselves. Uh, and you can use this to find uh, bugs like or, or flaws in the usability at the early stages. Okay, so it's maybe not the only thing that you want to do, but it's certainly the first thing that you would probably try and do. And this is something all of you are going to do uh, for assignment two. Okay, uh, so expert review, you have an expert or developer uh, who does that. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, the next thing, if you want to kind of level up from that, what you can do is you can pull people off the street. Uh, you can put them in a lab setting. Uh, you can give them your tool or your software and you can ask them to use it. Okay. Then you're going to sit on the sidelines. You're going to measure uh, certain things. You're going to look for feedback uh, from the users and you're going to actually do like a sort of lab study on uh, how, how useful is this to use. Okay. <coughs> So here you're just sort of drawing random people kind of from the general population. Okay. The last thing you can do is called a field study. So a field study is like where you're very comfortable with it and you kind of want to pilot it with your actual users. Uh, but you might set it up so that not all the users get the new system right away. So maybe you give it to half of them, the other half you give a competing system or you give them no system at all. Uh, and then you're going to see what happens. Okay, you're going to see what happens to that subset. Maybe you're going to do some cross comparison between the subset that gets it and the subset that doesn't. Okay, in this case, the people you're giving to are the actual users themselves. Okay. So we'll go through this in nitty gritty detail, but just as a first glance, this is kind of the worst uh, because you're not using the actual users of the system. Here you, you're using the general population. So if you're writing a system for the general population, then that's good, right? If you're Facebook or whatever, then that's okay. But if I'm writing a tool for IT people and I bring in people off the street, they're not IT people necessarily, I can control for that. So like certainly if I do a user study, I can try and bring in people that are representative of my users, but they're not exactly the same as my actual users, okay? And there's some other deficiencies of user studies that we'll look at. Field study is the best, absolutely. Okay, so with the field study, you're actually getting your real users. They're using it in the real environment. Uh, usually they're long studies, like over courses of months kind of thing. And so they're using it for a long period of time. They're great. Uh, why don't we always just do field studies? Because they're expensive, right? And also when you do a field study, they're actually, people are using it in their real to real, like day to day job. And so if the software isn't good uh, or the system isn't good, then you're actually hindering their ability to perform for your company. So it's actually costing you money to run this field study if it's not actually uh, doing its job and helping them. Okay. So you don't want to field study everything. You want to be very confident uh, before you actually deploy a, a field study. Uh, but if you can do a field study, then, then you'll get the most uh, sort of reliable uh, uh, feedback uh, in terms of, of the actual usability of the system. Okay, um, so yeah, so generally you start with expert review, then you might do one or more user studies, and then maybe you have an opportunity to do a field study uh, at a certain point. Okay, and sometimes field studies are just like you push the update, right? And then everyone updates, and then you wait for the complaints to like roll in, right? So like, I won't name the kinds of companies, right, that, uh, <laughs> that do that kind of thing, but you know, they'll, ju they'll just push something out. It won't actually work that great on day one, uh, they'll get lots of feedback on it and then they'll fix it really fast. Uh, and so that's that's sort of an approach that, that some companies uh, use. Um, okay, so what I'll do is I'll, let me give you some details on, on what these things look like. So let's start with the user study. Okay, uh, so first off, I'll give you kind of like for each of these a sort of pros and cons. So none of them are perfect. Uh, some of them are better than others in some regards and not as good as others. Okay, the big pro of a user study, especially as compared to an expert review, is you're using real people. Okay, you're using people off the street. They're not experts. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's uh, a pro. You're using sort of normal people. Uh, the con is that the normal people might still not be the same as your target users. Okay, so they might be closer to your target users, but they might not be uh, just quite, quite, quite there yet. Okay, uh, so we call this in general. This is called representativeness. So 
So how representative is your sample of people that you're pulling into your user study with the actual target of what your users are? Do they have similar education levels? Do they have similar experience uh, using these types of technologies or these types of systems? Uh, you know, and so a lot of times too, you know, especially with user studies, they're done by researchers. Researchers tend to operate out of universities. Uh, so who are they going to pull in to user studies? Students, a lot of times, okay? Uh, and so there's lots and lots of user studies that are done using students. Uh, students are somewhat representative of, say, people that work at a company or of the general population, but they're also not representative in a lot of other ways, right? So it depends on your target user, but you either have, compared to the general population, I mean, you're all graduate students, right away you have an undergraduate degree, that puts you in an upper class of education, right? That's, that's a lot higher than the general population. Um, you also um, will probably not have any sort of industrial experience, right? So if this is meant to target some system that's meant to be deployed in a corporate environment, then you're sort of underrepresentative of that in that case. So you don't have that requisite experience, okay? Uh, so the way that you look uh, isn't necessarily better or worse, it's just different than the actual uses, the users of the system, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna try and get the most representative samples that you can get. And we'll talk about some methodologies that you can do to try and correct uh, if you don't have a, a fully representative sample, but uh, it's the first issue that you have to, to be aware of. Okay, so how close are study participants to the actual users? in terms of, and there's all sorts of relevant things, but uh, things like, so these are just examples, experience, knowledge, abilities, mental abilities, physical abilities, uh, et cetera. Okay, uh, the next thing is called ecological validity. Uh, and so this is just a fancy way of saying, if you pull people into a lab and you stand over their shoulder and watch them do a particular task, it's not they're not necessarily gonna behave the same way that they would if they were sitting in the living room of their home uh, in front of their computer, right? So for example, if, if you are pulled into a lab study and people are watching you and you're browsing the internet and they're like, okay, go to this website. So you type in the website and then all of a sudden there's a browser warning, right? And so there's someone like with a white lab coat with a clipboard, like writing down everything that you're doing and you're looking at this browser warning, are you just going to be like, oh, I don't know what that is, click next? Like maybe not, right? Like it's sort of an intimidating setting. You're hyper aware of the fact that you're being watched and, and things like that. So you might behave differently uh, in this lab setting, okay? Uh, so in that case, what we're saying is the lab setting isn't valid. It's not the ecology of where you would actually be using the software if you were a real user of the software. So there's some sort of mismatch uh, between the two. So it's, it's not a valid uh, ecology. So users might behave differently than they would in the real setting. Uh, other things, uh, user studies are very sort of time consuming. Uh, so usually we'll go through the methodology, but when your users come in, you usually want to get some information about them so you can do some statistics. Uh, so you're going to have them fill out a questionnaire or whatever the case may be. Maybe they can do that online before they show up. Uh, your book appointments, 
Uh, it depends on how complicated it is, what you know they want to do. So you might, you know, it might maybe it's 30 minutes or maybe it's 20 minutes if it's really fast. Maybe it's an hour uh, that you get with them. But even if you want to run something, let's say it's 30 minutes, you want to run 100 users, right? Uh, so that's 50 hours of work, right? Uh, 50 hours is a lot of time uh, that you have to be, you know, let's say you're a researcher, you have to spend 50 hours of your life, you know, just running these user studies and people miss appointments and things like that, no shows and things like that. So it'll end up being a little bit longer than that, okay? Uh, and at the end of the day, you get a kind of, maybe 100 participants isn't really enough to say whether it's usable or not, right? And uh, additionally, um, uh, totally forgot what I was going to say. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, you might have to run more uh, users than, uh, than that, than 100. Uh, so anyways, it, it ends up being a sort of time-consuming task. Oh yeah, and what I was going to say is at the end of the day, you only got like 30 minutes of their time, right? So you sort of spend 50 hours to get a statistically representative sample of what people can do in 30 minutes. Right, and so that's the, that ratio is like kind of off in terms of uh, the amount of time that you want to spend. Uh, and sort of related to that, there's only so much you can ask the users to do, right? So like you can't get them to sort of come in and use every aspect of your system, okay? Uh, if you only have 30 minutes with them or 60 minutes with them, you have to give them fairly narrow tasks. And so you'll be very confident of the usability of these narrow tasks, uh, but you won't be you won't have any confidence about sort of the broader tasks or the broader uses of your system uh, beyond this. Um, so you do a sort of a deep dive on some little aspect of your system uh, and it's very time consuming. Uh, it's also can be expensive. You usually, you will pay your um, participants. People aren't going to show up and use your software for free. Uh, you might not have to pay them a lot, but still you have to pay them something. And if you run it 100 times or 200 times, that adds up. You know, 20 bucks a pop or whatever, it still, it still adds up to some amount of money. Okay, now let's think about the methodology. So how do you actually do this? What does it look like? Okay, uh, so the very first thing that you have to do, uh, especially if you're working in a university environment, if you're in a private company, uh, they might not have procedures, but still a good, a good thing to do, is you should go get what's called ethics review. Okay, so ethics review is somebody else is going to look over your user study and just make sure that you're not, you know, stressing out your users, causing psychological issues or that type of thing. Usually with security software, it's very easy. It's sort of a turnkey uh, kind of solution. Uh, so there's usually not a big problem, uh, depending on exactly what you want to do, but uh, it's something that you, you do actually, you have to do. Even if you want to do it for your course project, you're like, oh, I love this user study thing. It sounds really great. Let me go do my class project on it. I can't accept it if you don't have a, a ethics review uh, from the university. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, anytime you deal with real human participants, uh, you need it uh, reviewed in terms of ethics. Now, the one place where you could actually get into trouble, where there could actually be ethical issues, usually tends to be around collect the collection of personal data. For example, let's say you want to do some study to figure out, do people actually choose secure passwords or not? Right. So you bring a bunch of people in and you're like, OK, tell me your Gmail password. Tell me your bank password. Tell me this. And then you're going to figure out whether they're secure or not. You can't do that. Like that will not pass ethics. Right. They, you can't collect that personal information from people because that personal information could be used to breach people's accounts. OK. A lot of times you're going to collect demographic information about your users. That's fine. Uh, you can collect it, but you have to think about how are you going to secure it. Uh, you're not going to put it up on Google Docs, you know, for the world to see or something like that. Uh, so you're going to have to have some uh, mechanisms in place so that you make sure that that data stays confidential uh, because at the end of the day, it is personally identifiable, identifiable uh, information. Okay. Um, so that's usually, if, if you're doing some sort of security thing, that's probably the most prevalent case where you might run into some issue with the ethics review. But in general, the study itself is, is usually uh, not problematic. 
Uh, it depends exactly what you're doing, like I said. Okay, the next thing you have to do is find some users. So recruit users for the study. Okay, uh, so if you're going to recruit users, first off, how do you, you know, I want to run a user say tomorrow, I have, you know, 50 hours of my time. Uh, how do I get 100 people, right? Like, do I literally go on the street and hand out flyers or like, do I put it up in the grocery store? Do I put it on bulletin boards around the university? How do you recruit? I'm not here to tell you how to recruit, but it's just the thing I'm going to say is that how you recruit could have an influence on who you recruit. Okay, so the types of users that come into your study are going to depend a lot on what was that that mechanism that you use to recruit users. Okay, uh, so if you put it, if you advertise it at a university, you're going to get lots of students, right? And so that's fine if you're looking for students or someone with like a similar demographic or knowledge or experience as students, and that's fine. Okay, but you have to pay attention. If you if you put up in a grocery store, it's going to be a different set of users. Take out a classified ad in the newspaper, a different set of users. Okay. Um, so how you recruit users will influence the population that you draw from. So it's going to be influenced by the population that you draw from. Uh, Another thing is universities will often maintain a list of, of users. So a lot of times they have like a list of kind of like 200 people that they know about that are willing to do these studies uh, in general. And uh, they, they tend to retain the names, especially if they fit in like different categories that are different than the, the type of person that would be easy to recruit. Right. So people that are older, for example, or people that work in specific industries or people with certain technique background, technical background or that type of thing. Um, and so you can go and ask for that sort of list and then you at least have a kind of seed group uh, that can start your study. So that's one thing that uh, universities that do a lot of these user studies will sort of curate over time. They'll all be based in Montreal or something like that. And so you can, uh, you can start from there uh, before you just start randomly recruiting people. Okay. Uh, the other thing is you can recruit online uh, and both in two ways. So one is you can recruit online so that they show up in person. The other thing is you could design your user study so it could be done remotely. Okay. So you're working with actual users, they're human users, uh, they're real users, they're just online instead as well. Okay. Uh, so users could be online. So there's a few services. Amazon owns something called Mechanical Turk. Uh, there's another one called, I can't remember if it's Crowdflower or Cloudflower. It'll click Crowd, that sort of makes more sense. Uh, MTurk doesn't work in Canada, or at least it didn't recently. So people would gravitate towards something that uh, did work in Canada. But in the US, this is used a lot. Um, and so these are people that you can pay a menial, menial amount of money to do any task that you want. Uh, so when Amazon like sort of, I don't think, I think they acquired this company to invent it, but anyways, the people imagine that like, for example, I don't know, you have a big collection of MP3 files. I know no, no one does that because you all subscribe to Spotify or whatever, but you want them all renamed, right? Like the, all the, the metadata is messed up, right? So you could sit there and you could do it file by file. It's really tedious. What if you paid someone three cents a song to do it for you? Okay, and it could be done online. So you would just upload it. You would say, this is the task. This is how much I'm paying. Someone could come along and say, I'll do that for you. Uh, and then you get your file. So that's, this was sort of the envision for it. And so this has become like a, a common go-to place for user studies, okay? Uh, especially if it's sort of questionnaire or using a web tool or something like that that can be conducted online. And there have even been studies on what are the demographics of people on these websites? What do they look like? Uh, how, what's their representativeness look like compared to a general population? Uh, and it shows that, that they're pretty good. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty kind of representative of the general population. Obviously, these are people who are online, like sort of sophisticated internet users to use a website like this. Uh, so on questions of technicality, 
they're not like novice users that don't know how to use the internet. Okay, uh, so there are some biases in terms of, of what they look like, uh, but but other than that, they look fairly close to the general population. Okay, uh, so now you have your users, so that's fine. Uh, so you got your ethics review, uh, you got a set of users. Uh, you are eventually going to have to figure out whether your users are representative of the users in your study are representative of the real users of your system. I'm going to assume that you already know what the real users of your system look like. And so you have to figure out, well, what are the people coming into my study? What do they look like? Okay, uh, so what you'll do, do is you'll define a questionnaire usually. So it's a pre-study questionnaire. And uh, you'll actually have this before you get to this stage because that's something that the ethics reviewer are going to look at. So they want to know uh, what is it, what are all the data uh, that you're collecting about your users and things like that. Uh, and, and they want to eliminate the collection of personally identifiable information as much as possible and, and things like that. Uh, so you'll usually have your questionnaire approved. They want to make sure that you're not asking irrelevant questions or uh, things that would infringe on people's privacy and, and that kind of thing for unless if it's somehow pertinent to the study itself. Um, so you you issue this pre uh, study questionnaire. It could be given online or it could be done in person. Uh, so you're trying to understand the demographics. of your participants, uh, sort of their past knowledge, experience, that kind of thing. And all of this is to basically align uh, your study participants to your actual users. So you want to align study participants to actual users. And so in order to do this alignment, uh, you can do a few things. You might drop users. So if you get a lot of users that are sort of representative of one kind of level of experience and you realize, oh, my, my study sample is getting kind of unbalanced. We have a lot of people who have undergraduate degrees. We don't want that. Uh, we want like less, we want more people that don't even have an undergraduate degree. Then you might start dropping uh, people from your study. Uh, so you could drop users from the study. Uh, you can also just use statistics to a certain extent. Uh, so there are statistical ways of weighting the impact. So not every participant in your study has, sort of has the same weight, carries the same weight in terms of the results uh, that you'll get. Uh, so you do statistical weight. And I'm not going to go through statistics in this course, but uh, they're, they're very involved techniques. Like it's not like the kind of thing that you read the Wikipedia article and then you figure out how you do it. You have to like ask someone who actually knows how to do this uh, properly in order to. Next thing you'll do is you'll pay your users. Why do you pay your users before they actually do the work? Uh, you don't want their participation contingent on being paid. Okay, so participants basically get paid whether they complete the study or not. Okay, so it's not like I'll give you the money, but you have to go all the way through the study. Uh, so one thing the ethics committees will assist on is that any user can withdraw at any time. Okay, if they don't like the study for whatever reason. They can say, sorry, I'm, I'm done. And you pay them just as if they completed the study. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not a, a way of coercing them to finish the study by withholding the payment. Now, sometimes you want to incentivize your users, so you might pay them more. Like there might be a bonus for like completing the task in certain ways, and so that you know ethics committees will approve that kind of thing. Uh, so you have to take it to them. So usually there's a baseline payment that you get and get regardless as long as you participate, and then there might be like some sort of bonus that uh, you know, especially in like sort of business cases or things like that where you're doing like some game theory or something like that. Uh, you want to, people to play a game, you want them to play it well, and so you're going to try and entice them. Uh, using money so they might get more. Uh, another thing is because this gets expensive, uh, even if you're, say, paying users not a lot, like say you have, I don't know, you're paying them 
twenty dollars for an hour of time. Uh, that's not particularly a lot of money, but if you have a hundred users, that's two thousand dollars. You have to find that two thousand dollars from somewhere. Uh, what some studies will do is they'll do things like they'll have an iPad, which is worth five hundred dollars, and they'll just lottery it off to the user. So all the users will get a chance of winning the iPad. They'll choose one at random uh, to actually win it. Uh, so that's the other thing, or they'll have Amazon gift cards or something like that. Um, so that, that could cost you $500 instead of costing you $2,000. Um, so that's, anyways, it's just a trick that, that sometimes people use. Okay, then the fifth study, or the fifth step is you're going to do the actual study. So let me uh, just put this on the next screen. Okay, there's all sorts of different studies. So studies look completely different. I can't possibly cover all the different ways that they look, but I'll give you probably the most common sort of approaches that are used, okay? Uh, so the most common approach is uh, what's called a comparative study. So in a comparative study, you have your new security thing. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to measure how usable it is relative to something else. Okay. So it might be some update and you're going to measure it relative to the system before the update. So it's the exact same system with the update or without the update. Maybe it's a competitor system. So you think your system is better than the competitors. Uh, so you're going to do a study between your system and a competing system with it, okay? Uh, it's very hard to just sort of establish usability out of thin air, have people come in and use it. Some, it will work for some, it, will work, it won't work for others. Uh, it's hard to say anything concrete, uh, but comparative, you can say things that are very concrete, right? You can say this clearly is better along these regards, it's worse along these regards. And so comparative studies are, are kind of the most straightforward to do where you, you get a concrete result. So say you have system A, you're going to compare it to system B, okay? Uh, so these could be com competitor, competitors, uh, they could be older versions of the system. That kind of thing, okay? So all you're really saying is the usability is moving in the right direction, okay? We don't know if we're fully there yet, but we are, we're, we're getting there, we're getting better uh, than whatever our existing uh, system is that we're comparing to. Okay, uh, the next thing you're going to do is, uh, once again, you can do it different ways, but this is the, the most sort of straightforward uh, way to do it is uh, what's called a between subjects approach. Okay. Uh, so before I say what this is, let's just think about this conceptually. So you have a bunch of users. Uh, you want to know whether system A is better than system B along some usability parameters. We're not sure what those are. Uh, so what might be tempting to you is, okay, you're going to bring a user in. Uh, you'll get them to use system A. You'll see how, they, how it works. And then you'll get them to use system B. And you'll see how it works. And you'll compare the two. Okay. Um, that approach has some problems with it. Okay. The first one is that the system that you choose to get them to use first can bias them when they use the second system, okay? So when they use system A first, then uh, they might be better at using system B, especially if system A is very close. Like system A is kind of like a warm up. They sort of learn things by using system A. Then they're going to perform better using system B just because it was second, okay? So then you might say, well, maybe I'll swap it. So half my users will use system A, half of them will use system B. That maybe works, but always the whoever uses it second, you it's not reliable basically. 
Okay, so the between subjects approach says, take your users, split them in half. Half of them use system A and only system A. Half of them use system B and only system B. Okay, so it's not the same person using both systems. Uh, it's half of them are using one system, half of them are using another system. Okay, so that's the approach. Uh, we'll talk about what problem it solves. I'll, I'll summarize that and, and also how you do the split. Okay, so this the problem it's solving is called the learnability effect, which is that the more you use something, even if it's not the exact same thing, you're using something similar to it, uh, you're going to learn and then you're going to perform better. Uh, so this is going to eliminate the learnability effect, uh, which would happen if, if you have them use system A and then system B immediately after. Uh, the second thing you have to do is you have to be really careful how you split your participants. Okay, you can't go to a participant and say, we have two systems, you choose. Would you rather use A or would you rather use B? Uh, because maybe you don't know why they choose A as opposed to B. And maybe users with a certain background gravitate towards A and certain ones gravitate towards B. Okay, what you want it to be is random. Okay, so you want that choice to be random. Okay, so you're going to randomly assign users between A and B. Now, maybe your demographics are off in terms of the user participants. And so maybe you're like, maybe you only have like a couple users that look a certain way. And so maybe you're going to make sure that they both end up, some of them end up on A and some of them end up on B. Okay. So I'm not saying that it's literally flipping coins, right? Sometimes there is a bit of statistical weighting in terms of who gets assigned to what to ensure that, that on both sides of system A and B, you have some balance in terms of the demographics. So not all the expert users in your sample happen to end up on system A as opposed to system B. Okay. Uh, but if you have enough users and you have a big enough sample of users, then you can flip coins. Okay. Uh, and then it will statistically uh, the likelihood of, of a lot of expertise concentrating on one as opposed to the other is just statistically unlikely. Uh, so this is sometimes called A-B testing. Uh, so like websites use it a lot. They'll show uh, it's more in a field study uh, scenario because it's dealt with, you're dealing with actual users, uh, but they have some new update. They think it's great. Uh, they want to make sure it's great before they use it. Uh, so what they'll do is when you log into the site, they'll randomly assign you to see either the new version of the website or the old version of the website. Okay. Then they'll collect some, some metrics on it and, and then they'll decide. Okay. Or you might use it. Uh, let's say you, you're running an ad campaign. So Google actually automates this for you. So you go and you buy some Google AdWords. So when people type cer certain search words in, your ad appears. Okay. And what Google will say is, hey, why don't you write two versions of your ad? Okay. Right, version one, you know, version one, you're going to appeal to people's emotions, and version two, you're going to appeal to their knowledge, right, or whatever the case may be. We'll show half of the users, we'll just randomly flip a coin, and half the users are going to see uh, ad A, and half of them are going to see ad B. And then uh, after we're done your campaign, uh, we'll send you an email, and we'll and you'll see that a hundred people click through on uh, ad A, and a thousand people click through on on ad B. Right, so ad B is more effective than ad B and then ad A, right? And then in the next campaign, you'll start with B, that will be your baseline, and then you might do two smaller variants of B and then try and uh, basically optimize to get the most click throughs or, or that kind of thing, okay? Uh, so that's that's called A B testing. Uh, so, anyways, you're going to do essentially that same kind of approach. You're going to randomly assign users. Obviously, if you have more systems, you could compare three, four systems, uh, then uh, you're splitting your group smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, that's going to have a consequence. Okay, so uh, you do need a large group, and the more you split them, the smaller your groups are. The more participants you're going to end up needing uh, in order to get statistically valid uh, results. But we'll we'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to use a script or written instructions.
Okay. If you just wing it, if you bring a user in and I'm the lab administrator, so I'm going to administer the tests and I'm just going to explain to the user how to do it, uh, I'm going to say different things to every user. Okay. I'm going to explain it slightly different uh, to all the users. Probably the 50th user, I'll, I'll have figured out a better way of explaining it so they'll get a sort of better experience. That's all going to bias your results. Okay. So you want everyone to come in, you want them all to have an equal experience. Uh, the exact same experience. So you want to remove all the variance between different runs of the study with different users so that literally the only difference, at the end of the day, you want the only difference to be A and B, right? Everything else, every other aspect of the study is exactly the same, okay? Uh, so that's ideally, you want to isolate that as the only difference, okay? So one way that you can do it is, the best thing is just to write down the instructions and they can read it. Uh, or if you are going to read it to them, then you'll, you'll read it from a script. <coughs> you also have to be careful. Users will have questions, so you can answer questions. But, you know, if I'm grumpy on that day, maybe I don't give good explanations. There's someone else and I like them, they're friendly, that kind of thing. And so maybe I explain things better uh, to them. Uh, the grumpy person ends up in test in study A and the other one's in, in study B. Now I've sort of biased the results and it all is just on me and my mood. It had nothing to do with whether A is better than B or B is better than A. Uh, so you want to try and equalize everyone's experience and eliminate uh, the variance between each run of the study. Okay. So now you've run your study. Okay. Uh, and so uh, you have some results and now you want to analyze what those results are. So we didn't really say what results you're gathering, what's the actual data that you're gathering, but we'll, we'll sort of infer that out from what you're going to do with the results. Uh, so this is sort of the post-study analysis. Okay, uh, so the first thing you're gonna do is, ideally before the study even starts, uh, but maybe you, you do a preliminary look at the data. Sometimes people run studies sort of incrementally, so they'll, they'll run kind of, they call a pilot study, where they sort of get a kind of feel for what's going on and then they sort of sharpen the study uh, in subsequent iterations. But at some point you're gonna form uh, what's a fancy word is a hypothesis, okay? So, you know, A is better than B along these regards or B is, is better than A or whatever the case may be. Okay, so you're gonna have what your actual hypothesis is. What is it that you're setting out to prove? So hypothesis for me. And then ultimately you want your study to either prove or disprove your hypothesis. And prove is a very strong word. Uh, what do we mean by prove? Usually what you're doing is you're trying to show statistically that there's a difference uh, between it or statistically it's likely that your hypothesis is true or it's unlikely that, that it's true. Um, so you're, you're trying to do some sort of statistical test. Okay, statistics work a lot better on numbers. Okay, so what, what is the data that you're looking for, right? So you might do things like, um, how long does it take a user to complete a task? Okay, that is something that's measurable, right? You can start a stopwatch, you can stop the start watch, you get a number, okay? If system A users are faster than system B's users, you'll see that in the numbers. You can run some statistical tests. You can show that system A is faster than system B for your set of users. Okay. So that's really great. And that is kind of usability, right? It's something that's, that's closer to usability, right? But how easy is the system to use, right? There's no like real stopwatch for like how you, easy is this system to use, right? Uh, and so when you do usability, a lot of the things that you want to measure are what we call qualitative as opposed to quantitative. In other words, they're, they're things that you would describe. They're not things that you put a number on, okay? Um, so usability... measures can be qualitative not quantitative okay 
Okay, uh, and so usually what happens, the most common approach in usability is to try and convert qualitative measures like how you feel about something into a number. Okay, and all of you know how this is done because you've all done it lots and lots of times. You'll do it for me personally uh, at the end of this course. Uh, the most common way is to use something called a Lackert scale. Okay, does anyone know what that is? No. Okay, so it's you all know what it is, you just don't know the name of it. Okay, so Lackert scale looks like this. Uh, there's a question, qualitative question that doesn't have a numeric answer. And they say, okay, we want you to answer this question. And the way you're going to answer this question is uh, we have five dots, and uh, if you strongly agree, right, you'll you'll color that in. If you strongly disagree, you color this in. If you're sort of in the middle, you're kind of like borderline. If you agree but not strongly, you would color that in. If you disagree, sorry, if you disagree but not strongly, you color that in, and and. Conversely, if you agree, but not strongly, you would color that in, okay? Why, why do you see those everywhere? Why do people love them? Uh, the reason is because they're taking something that's qualitative. What do you think of the professor of this course? Was this a useful course to you? And it turns it into a number, right? So I get a number at the end of the day, hopefully a low number because that's how it's scaled. So like I get a 1.3, and then when I look in, I see what, how about everyone in my department, right? Am I getting a lower number than everybody else in my department? Right, uh, I'll win a teaching award because my number is lower than the five other people that applied. Okay, uh, and all of that is because students felt that I was an effective teacher, and they communicated that by, you know, putting these, filling out these kind of Lackert scales. Okay, so Lackert scale is super common uh, in usability studies. A lot of usability really just comes out to people filling these things out. What goes wrong when you ask people to fill these things out? Okay. Uh, the most common is, I agree, I agree, I agree, right, like strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly strongly, or if they're in a bad mood, strongly disagree, strongly disagree, strongly disagree, okay? Can you do anything about that? No. So you can, actually. Okay, so what you can do is, yeah, you can randomize the list of questions. How many people take the first question seriously compared to the last question, right? People spend more time on the first one than the last one. So you can randomize the order. Another thing, if you've taken a lot of these quizzes, you'll see that they ask the same question the same. They'll, they'll ask the same question multiple times. They want to see that you answer exactly the same way all three times. Sometimes they'll flip the answer. So like this professor is an effective teacher, strongly agree. This professor is an ineffective teacher. Then you have to strongly disagree. If you're going to strongly agree all the way down, you're going to strongly agree with me being effective and in, ineffective, which is a contradiction. And so statistically, I'll see that and then I'll eliminate you uh, from the sample or I'll, I'll take the weight of your uh, roll down. Okay, so these are some of the tricks that you can play with Lackert scales. They're not perfect. Uh, you can correct them. Next class, I'll write them all down for you and then we'll keep going uh, with the analysis of usability studies. So thank you. I'll see you next class.